Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. So I did math rock all that time ago, Christ, what seems like years now, so I thought it was time to say hello to its belligerent younger sibling. I'm going to give you five albums to get you into mathcore. Mathcore is technical, aggressive music. It's a potent fusion of blistering guitar lines, seething bass and pummeling drums with hardcore style vocals and all of these different elements interweave into very contrasting sections. They use atonality and dissonance more to create a much more combative atmosphere. Polyrhythms are used, which is two rhythms being used at one time, which adds to the complexity of the music that's being created. This sits mathcore at the centre of a very varied musical palette, one with the attack of hardcore, the complexity and technicality of metal and grindcore, but also the exploratory feeling of a genre like jazz. And in fact, one of the records I'm going to talk about today has a couple of passages which are clearly very jazz influenced. So in these, in this unlikely mashup, you have the ferocity and complexity of the mathcore style. Mathcore properly kicked off towards the end of the 90s, and there is basically a holy trinity of mathcore records, a bit like Shoegaze records when I did five albums to get you into Shoegaze way back. So obviously I will be talking about those three albums to start off with. There is, as always, a contention when it comes to labels this time, whether some of these bands are labeled mathcore or perhaps metalcore. I'm keen to hear your thoughts on that. Let's have a discussion about it. So let me know in the comment section below. Let's get into it. Number one, Botch with We Are The Romans, released in 1999. Oh boy, here we go. Botch were a band who got together in 1993 in Washington State in a port city called Tacoma. They only ever released two full-length records, but their second and final record, We Are The Romans, released in 1999, which is today's pick, is an incendiary record, and it's also an era-defining one. It's one which defined and influenced many musicians who were playing heavy music, but they wanted to get a bit more technical with their sound. So the ideas that Botch were working with on We Are The Romans came to define mathcore as an idea. The way the band redefined what people termed as hardcore music is best summed up by guitarist Dave Knudsen, who says that Tim Latona, the drummer of the band, always used to say this. The point of Botch was, as Tim always put it, keep it in a weird time signature so when they're banging their heads, they're banging them on the wrong beat. It's something you might have even said if you ever played in a band when you were younger, which was heavy but also quite technical. I know when I was about 16, 17 and I played in a couple of different bands, we thought it'd be hilarious the idea of throwing some kind of sideways rhythmic or melodic complexity to an audience to confuse them. There's a flavour of anarchy in there which goes hand in hand with the hardcore scene that this has grown out of, the punk scene, but also there's just a slightly different take on it. It's the technical side of things, adding technicality into the music. Opening track to Our Friends in the Great White North lays out Botch's mission statement with its varied time signatures, its fast polyrhythms, its aggression and Dave Valeran's attacking vocals. They use dissonance to their advantage in these sections, but they also know when to pull back. And what that does is that gives those more intense sections much more clout. There's a dynamic understanding here, a dynamic sensibility. The halftime change up at the midpoint of the track allows the whole band to come together on this big, meaty groove, and it only allows the knotty section a reprisal in the outro. The bravery to experiment with this sound is what makes We Are The Romans such a breathtaking listen. On Swimming The Channel versus Driving The Channel, they sound like Slint. I mean, if you listened to this on its own, I think you'd think it was a post-rock track, because that's what it sounds like. You have Valerian's spoken word accompanied by Latona's languid drum patterns, and then Brian Cook and Dave Nudson's guitar parts on top of that. It's, it's a very slint moment. I really like this moment because it's very held back and it proves that this is a band that are all about crafting mood. It's not just about the complex moments, the complexity of the music, the technicality of the music. That is there, but that's there to craft mood as well. And they understand that there has to be some give and take I mean, not with all mathcore records, but this is how this mathcore record operates, and that is to its credit. Man the Ramparts has a spectral male choir, another great example of them experimenting with form and instrumentation. It's actually quite sad that the band couldn't settle their differences and ended up splitting up in 2002, because I feel like they would have become much more of a household name in terms of the mathcore world. You know, Dillinger Escape Plan have become that, obviously, but I think it's sad that Botch often get left out of these conversations, because this is an important record in the mathcore genre. We Are The Romans is an essential listen to get into mathcore, and also it's a great listen for anybody who's a fan of impassioned, aggressive, technically impressive music. Number two, 
the Dillinger Escape Plan with Calculating Infinity, also released in 1999. To me, a long-time Dillinger fan, it feels like sacrilege to not be picking a record with vocalist Greg Pucciato on it, the guy who joined the band in 2001 and became such an integral part of who the Dillinger Escape Plan were, not just who they were on their records, but also part of those infamous live performances. It would also be sacrilege to leave out one of the most important mathcore records we ever got, an absolute monument of technical and aggressive music, which happens to be the Dillinger Escape Plan's debut record, Calculating Infinity. Forming in New Jersey in 1997, the only founding member which ended up staying in the band all the way to their breakup in 2016, the firebrand guitarist Ben Wyman, who also wrote most of the music. Uh, he was interviewed in 2016 by The Independent, and he talked about how Calculating Infinity came to life. Everything about Dillinger was incorrect. Certainly in terms of theory, we went against everything. Calculating Infinity was us effectively ripping up the music theory book. If someone said, don't harmonize with a second, it just sounds out of tune, then every single lead we did, we'd harmonize with a second. It sounded disgusting, but we did it. And maybe we finally took that to the nth degree with this album. We totally went against the rules. And that's allowed for our personalities to come through much more on this record because we didn't let anybody sway us at all. The lineup of this early period of Dillinger was completed by Chris Penny on drums, one of the most ferocious performers you are likely to ever come across. The ragged screams of Dimitri Minakakis, who Greg Pucciato ended up replacing. Also, we had Mike Patton on an EP after Calculating Infinity, which you should definitely check out because that's a, a brilliant EP. We have Brian Benoit on additional guitar, and Wyman also played bass on this record because Adam Dole, who was the bassist, was involved in a horrific car accident where he became paralyzed. Wyman is absolutely right when he says in that interview snippet that Calculating Infinity sounds disgusting. Oh, it does. Alongside the confrontational nature of their music, the grinding guitars, Minakakis's howl, Penny's thrashing drum kit work, you also have intensity created through the complexity of their musicianship. The opening track, Sugar Coated Sour, is surely one of the most brutal tracks to open a record. In just under two and a half minutes, it succeeds in unremittingly bashing you over the head, just as Wyman once did to me with his headstock when he was crowd surfing at a gig. Got me right there. Penny's kit work utilizes those requisite double bass pedals, blast beats, things you expect to hear in metal, but it's the even more technical moments that make Dillinger so interesting to listen to. During a particularly jazzy interview, the way that Penny uses his snare dynamically alongside Wyman challenging John McLaughlin, I mean, he sounds like Mahavishnu Orchestra on this, the way he challenges that sound, it gives you a brief 10 second respite before the entire band throw back down again. Second track, 43% Burnt, is one of the all-time great Dillinger tracks, and it's a track that survived in their live sets all the way up to them splitting up in 2016. It is absolutely unforgiving, and Minakakis's vocals are fairly abstract, but reportedly about the idea of broken relationships. I just feel it. Everything's fine. Spit on yourself. You're so beautiful. Crack and chip off like the sun won't shine down. That final section of the track pulls things back to that seismic bass and guitar riff, and Penny's half-time drum beat fades out along with the rest of the track. It's kind of unsettling that it fades out and it doesn't end definitively. On Destro's Secret, there's a really interesting juxtaposition between Wyman's intricate clean guitar parts, the knotty drum rhythms, and then Minakakis' screams. It creates a really uncomfortable atmosphere because it's not truly heavy, but there's that underlying tension, and then you have the band jumping from these moments to just intense sections of mania. And then a track like Weekend Sex Change already points to the future development of this band's musical exploration. We have a very atmospheric cut complete with low register piano hits, atmospheric strings and synths. One of the greatest heavy records of all time. Number three, Converge with Jane Doe, released in 2001. And we reach the contentious choice for today's video. Many people will claim that the Massachusetts band Converge's defining genre label is metalcore, and they may be right about that. However, I think that when you're talking about the inception of a genre and talking about some of the most important records and places you really should start when you check out mathcore, I really don't think you can leave Converge out. Whilst they may be more hardcore punk tinged than Dillinger, their level of technical ability and the way that they approach their music is still very similar, and it's very mathcore. Now, you can disagree with that if you like, and if you do want to disagree with that, Go down to the comments section, let's hash it out. Converge got together in 1990, created by Kurt Ballou, guitarist, and Jacob Bannon, 
vocalist. They are the two sole members who started the band and are still in the band to this day. And Bannon has openly admitted the amount of time that they've been in this band means they've matured alongside the explosive music they've been creating. Jane Doe is Converge's fourth LP, released in 2001, and is capable of attacking you, the listener, with the piercing ability of a thousand needles. No, I don't think that's hyperbole. Opening track Concubine into second track Fault and Fracture wastes no time in demonstrating this. Bannon's vocals are so distorted they sound as if they might just cut out altogether, leaving you no space to escape from the discordant guitars of Baloo and Dalbeck, Newton's bass and Collar's unabated drums. The guitars are so discordant, more so than in Calculating Infinity. Heaven in Her Arms has this 7-8 section where this disgusting, grinding bass entwines with the drums, and it's a complex, aggressive moment that to me is absolutely mathcore. It's a synthesis of what is so great about technical and heavy music. There is also a breakdown towards the end of this track, which is very metalcore, so I can see the contention in attributing these genre labels to this band. Elsewhere though, the more experimental side of the band begins to seep out. Hell to Pay has slightly dreamier vocals, and the bass is given space to really cut a deep groove into the track. Or the particularly emotive finale, the 11 minute Jane Doe, which sends the record out on quite a melodic note, which you might not expect after the rest of the record has been tearing you limb from limb. Like Minakakis's lyrical focus, Bannon focuses on the negativity of relationships on this record. And though you might not actually be able to make out what he's saying because of his necrotic screams. There's a real poetic depth to what he's saying. It's probably worth noting that in the liner notes of Jane Doe, the lyricism is obscured. And although the band have uploaded the lyrics to their website, some suggest that it might be different to what Bannon's actually singing in the tracks. Nevertheless, I heard that phone call, the hesitation, the awkward silence. I felt everything in those seconds, splinters of sentence and heartless advice. Nothing is changed but these days entwined. A cornerstone of mathcore, metalcore and technical music that has enough heart to balance the seething fury. Number four, Car Bomb with Centralia, released in 2007. Now we're out of the holy trinity of mathcore, I can start talking about a slightly more recent record. This band were clearly influenced by bands like Botch, Converge, Dillinger, but also by a band like Meshuggah, uh, a band which were integral to the technical metal scene's development. With these influences, they crafted one of the greatest mathcore records I have ever listened to, one of snaking complexity, a myriad of divergent moments that dazzle in their technicality and their anger. Centralia is the debut album of Car Bomb, a band which got together in Long Island in 2007. They were originally on Relapse Records, so they were label mates with bands like Dillinger, Dying Fetus, Pig Destroyer, other lovely band names are available. Uh, but they were dropped from this label and subsequently released everything else independently. This quartet consists of Michael Daffner on vocals, Greg Kubaki on guitar, John Modell on bass, and Elliot Hoffman on drums. And boy, can they play. Centralia is a colossal beast of a record, despite only being 32 minutes long. It ends up being one of the mathcore records I tend to revisit more than others. I think it's just one of those albums that manages to really blast the cobwebs away and probably squash the spider as well. Opening track Pieces of You wastes no time with Kubaki's guitar flinging from palm muted riffs to ear splitting high tones as Hoffman demonstrates his propulsive technical abilities with blast beats. I'll make no bones about it, the guitar work on Centralia is incredible. The technical skill involved dazzles but more importantly, there's an experimental streak that runs through these parts that stops it from feeling like wankery for the sake of it. The ascending guitar tones on Gum Under the Table sound like some kind of demented car alarm, pretty apt for a band that are called Car Bomb. As with Dillinger, Botch, and even to a certain extent Converge, Car Bomb know how to play with space and more atmospheric sections to contrast with the heavier, more intense moments. For example, in Gum Under the Table, we have the interlude with the reverbed drums that disappear into a hushed, space. And of course that whole section is then crushed by the bombardment of the next section, but there's that dynamic contrast once again which seems to be defining the mathcore records I'm talking about. The way Deferner's vocal follows the fast rhythmic hits on the 28 second track RID reminds me of something that Serge Tankian used to do with System of a Down tracks, only with the frenetic rage dialed up several notches. Speaking of vocal performances, Deferner's heavy breathing on the track Cellophane Stiletto is downright confrontational. The pinched harmonics and crisp drum rhythms create just another great interlude 
on this record, one which contrasts with the subsequent brutal section. It's a feature Carbom constantly employ on Centralia to brilliant effect. The clean guitar tones at the end of Cello Drive going into Solid Grey, for example. Oof. Hypnotic Worm has an opening section which speeds up and then slows down. It's almost as if the tempo can't be stabilized. The band are wrangling to try and get it stabilized. And what's really technically impressive is that the band all managed to play so tightly and in unison with this unfixed tempo. Just a, an amazing moment. Such a solid record. Please go and check it out. Number five, the Tony Danza tap dance extravaganza with Danza 4, the Alpha, the Omega, released in 2012. Bloody hell, that is a mouthful. Has there ever been a greater band name? Probably not. Joining the ranks of technical or heavy bands with names that seem like in-jokes none of us are part of, like You Slut or Aborted Hitler Cock, please don't go and check out the second band. The Tony Danza Tap Dance Extravaganza were a Tennessee band that has a long list of people who were involved in recording cycles, touring cycles, but at the end of the day, for this final record in the Tony Danza Tap Dance Extravaganza band, which I love saying that name because it's such a tongue twister, and every time I get it right, I'm well happy with myself, but for this final record, Jesse Freeland, who is the was the founding member and the vocalist, leads proceedings along with a guy called Josh Travis, who recorded and performed every single instrumental part on this record. That's an impressive feat on any album, never mind the level of ability required to nail these parts. The fact that Travis can play bass, drums, and guitar to this level makes me sick with envy. Danza 4, the Alpha, the Omega, released in 2012, is part of a full record cycle for this band, and to be quite honest, I think it's the best thing they ever did. It's a record that plays with melodic motifs as much as crushing breakdowns, but it doesn't forget those noodly mathy sounds of their earlier records. I just think it's a blast from start to finish. I think one of the things that impresses me the most about this record is how well it flows. One of the criticisms that could be laid at Mathcore's feet is the disjointed sequencing of some of the records. However, the music is kind of disjointed and insubordinate anyway, so that seems to fit. But what's amazing about Alpha Omega is that it keeps that barbed intensity throughout, but it's also a measured journey of a record. They manage to keep that intensity going and keep your interest held for an almost hour long running time. Behind those eyes is the opening track and it sounds wholeheartedly metalcore until Travis starts messing around with the time signatures in a fierce sequence that serves as a bridge to the next crushing riff. Rudy Times 3 uses discordance and actually the opening riff sounds very Dillinger. I don't think it's difficult to hear the influence there at all. And Freeland expressing a lot of unfiltered energy through his performance, which perfectly matches with that technical cacophony that Travis is creating. The crushing power of the seven minute Paul Bunyan and the Blue Ox is a massive highlight, a brilliant track. Part of their success in creating a cohesive hour long record is their use of ambient soundscapes, different ideas, and not just those kind of riff riding, crushing moments. It's what other bands on my list today have employed and to great effect. And the Tony Danza tap dance extravaganza, yes, employ that as well to very good effect. So you have these ambient pads which serve as a bridge from the track Crossfire into Hold the Line. Hold the Line's a track which is about, well it's dedicated to the armed forces and it actually has samples of frontline battles in it which makes for quite a poignant track. You should really check this record out, whether you're a fan of the style or you've never listened to Mathcore before. And that's my five albums to get you into Mathcore. Lots to discuss on this genre. Please let me know your thoughts on the records I picked in the comments section below. Please join me on the Deep Cuts Discord on Tuesday at 10 o'clock BST, where we will be listening to the Dillinger Escape Plan's Calculating Infinity. It's gonna be a wild one, can't wait. Thank you for watching as always. See you next week.